The U.S. is propping up yet another dictator in Haiti. For several years now, Haitians have been calling on their U.S. puppet president, Jovenel Moise, to resign. Most recently, Haitian workers carried out a general strike in protest of Moise, who's refused to step down from office at the end of his term on February 7th. Despite being completely unpopular, the Biden administration is backing Moise's claim to power. This recent move is really just the latest in a hundred year long history of the US forcing puppet regimes on Haiti. Here's the timeline. Haiti's original sin was successfully overthrowing French colonialism in 1804, which turned Haiti from France's most prized slave colony to the world's first black republic. The impact of the Haitian Revolution really can't be overstated. For slavery dependent empires, this was their worst nightmare. Napoleon described his reasons for trying to crush the revolution with the utmost honesty, saying, quote, My decision to destroy the authority of black people in Saint-Domingue is not so much based on considerations of commerce and money, as on the need to block the forward march of black people in the world. And for the United States, which had based its whole economy on the use of slave labor, the possibility of a massive slave rebellion became all the more real. The Haitian government was even offering to pay American sailors $40 each for every enslaved African that they brought from the United States to Haiti, threatening to undermine the whole U.S. slaveocracy. At first, the U.S. simply refused to recognize Haiti at all. President Andrew Johnson flirted with the idea of annexing Haiti because, well, why not? It's not like the U.S. cared a whole lot about what the Haitians thought. These discussions also came at a time of massive U.S. expansion. In the late 19th century, it invaded Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and the Philippines. In his 1904 State of the Union address, President Theodore Roosevelt declared that the U.S. would invade any country that was too weak to defend itself. In 1915, this declaration would be turned against Haiti. At the time, Haitians had just overthrown their tyrannical president. The U.S. claimed that in the interest of preventing anarchy, they would have to seize the funds in the Haitian National Treasury and invade the country. Within days, Marines had taken over the Haitian capital and put a new US-backed president in power. The US also rewrote Haiti's constitution, a process overseen by then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The constitution allowed foreign land ownership in Haiti, something Haitians bitterly opposed after the overthrow of the French. The U.S. occupied Haiti for 19 years and killed thousands of rebel fighters. Over this period, the Marines trained a force called the Haitian Guard to eventually transfer power to. The Haitian Guard put a Haitian face on the state's repressive apparatus, but continued to serve the same role as the Marines. One of the many Haitians bitterly opposed to the occupation was a man named Francois Duvalier, more commonly known as Papa Doc. Papa Doc ran for president on a black nationalist populist platform and portrayed himself as the candidate of the black masses running against his elite mixed race opponent. Upon winning the election and becoming president in 1957, Papa Doc immediately changed his tune. All Papa Doc cared about was maintaining power. He hired private death squads and massacred anyone that he felt was disloyal or in his way. Public executions were a regular part of life and the executions were broadcast on TV for weeks. Entire towns were massacred if even suspected of being some kind of rebel stronghold. None of this was possible without massive financial support from the United States. The US wanted to crush the new socialist leader of Cuba, Fidel Castro, and offered Papa Doc massive foreign aid payments in exchange for his opposition to Cuba. After rewriting the Haitian constitution to allow himself to run for a second term, he held elections where he was the only candidate on the ballot. He won 1.3 million votes to zero. Later on, he held a referendum where 99% of people voted for him to be president for life, a title he wore proudly. Papa Doc killed an estimated 30,000 innocent people during his 14 year regime. Near the end of his life, Papa Doc made his son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, or Baby Doc, president of Haiti, at the age of 19. Baby Doc continued to run Haiti exactly as his father had, and the CIA continued to arm him to the teeth. He rode around in expensive cars and lived a luxurious life, while around half the population made less than $1.25 a day. 
Combine the low wages with tax incentives targeted at multinational corporations, and Haiti quickly became a source of cheap sweatshop labor. Haitians fled the repression and poverty in droves. About 220,000 Haitians left Haiti during the two Duvalier dictatorships and came here. 70% of Haiti's skilled workers still live abroad. The U.S. has historically denied Haitians refugee status, even though they were propping up the brutal dictatorships that these people were fleeing from. The Biden administration deported 70 Haitians just last week, all while backing Moise's crackdown on protests. The U.S. policy of blatantly propping up brutal dictators in Latin America was causing more problems than it was solutions. These dictators gave rise to heroic communist rebel movements and martyrs. The U.S. decided it had to lessen its footprint, at least ostensibly, and actually allow elections to take place. In Haiti, this would end up backfiring. In 1990, Haiti held its first free election. A former liberation theology priest, John Bertrand Aristide, won an overwhelming victory against a U.S.-backed World Bank economist named Mark Bazin. At his inauguration, Aristide declared that his election marked Haiti's second independence, first from French slavers and now from the various neocolonial powers that controlled Haiti for decades. During his brief period in office, Aristide tried implementing sweeping social reforms. He created a literacy program and raised the minimum wage. The U.S. immediately started sponsoring democracy enhancement programs in Haiti, which was really just a coded way of saying that they were funding Aristide's opposition. On September 29, 1991, Haitian army factions laid siege to the presidential palace. Aristide supporters rallied in support of the president, but the army gunned the demonstrators down, killing hundreds. Aristide had to flee to Venezuela. The U.S.-backed candidate from the 1990 election, Mark Bazin, became the new de facto prime minister. The Haitian left described the coup and Bazin's appointment as the American plan, which they described as a plan to keep Haiti a source of low-cost labor. They felt Mark Bazin was the embodiment of this plan. Aristide eventually returned to Haiti and went on to win the 2000 presidential election, running on a platform of making France pay $21 billion in reparations to Haiti. Again, factions of the army and paramilitary groups invaded the capital in 2004 and forced Aristide out. Aristide was flown out of the country on a U.S. plane under highly suspicious circumstances. Aristide says U.S. Embassy staff and Marines showed up to his home and said that a lot of Haitians would die if he didn't resign and come with them. Members of the Bush administration completely denied these accusations. However, Charles Rangel and Maxine Waters, who were both in touch with the Aristide family, told them a different story. They said that the Aristides called them immediately after the incident and told them that they had been cooed by U.S. forces. Colin Powell tried to dismiss the two congressional members, but Maxine Waters replied that she had little reason to trust the State Department because they lied so often. In Haiti, a new pro-U.S. de facto prime minister took power and with help from his paramilitary allies, tried to stabilize the situation by killing thousands. The continued reign of the American plan gutted the country and crippled its response to the devastating 2010 earthquake. For example, the state-owned cement company was sold to private investors and promptly shut down. Despite being a country rich in limestone, the key ingredient for making cement, Haiti had to import cement after the cement company closed down, severely slowing down the rebuilding effort. WikiLeaks revealed how private companies capitalized on the post-disaster gold rush in housing construction and restoration efforts. This was openly facilitated by Haitian President Michel Martelly, who declared, this is the new Haiti, we're open for business. Martelly himself was elected under dubious circumstances where the United States intervened to uphold election results where over 20% of the votes were ruled invalid. Moyes is Martelly's hand-picked successor and cut from the same neoliberal, neo-Duvalierist cloth. He clings to power using the same fraudulent electoral trickery. The Biden administration backing the totally illegitimate Moyes government is nothing new. 
It's just a continuation of over a hundred years of neocolonial policy towards Haiti. The idea that the United States ever had an interest in promoting democracy or stability in Haiti is contradicted by the long list of dictators and death squads that the United States unleashed on the country. So as people living in the United States, we can't let our government impose this neoliberal shock doctrine on Haiti. Not just because it's wrong, not just because the government claims to do it in our name, but also because all freedom-loving people have Haiti to thank for leading the first ever successful revolution of the masses of society and inspiring freedom fighters across the world.